very happy to be here today. I, I do want to recognize, though, I'm, I'm on the traditional territory of Kualandan and Ta'an, uh, Kwachan Council First Nations. Um, very, uh, very happy to be a part of the biomass economy and uh, have, uh, have a bit of a story to tell, I guess. Uh, if you could move through the slides a bit here. Um, just a little bit of a background. Um, so uh, Gunta Business uh, is a 10-year uh, old consulting company. Um, if you just uh, flip to the background uh, slide, please. We've, um, we've operated uh, out of Whitehorse. So we're, you know, we operate out of a, um, we operate with communities. Uh, sorry, uh, Mike, next slide, the, the background slide. We, we operate with uh, communities mostly in the Yukon, but we've been working with Ontario, BC to a lesser extent. Um, but the commonality that uh, a lot of the communities that we're, we're working with are very similar to the, my own community. And so there's, there's a lot of interesting parallels. Um, so we've been actively doing uh, feasibility research for other communities and, and helping some project management along some of the, the, the pain points in delivering a biomass project, a community-wide biomass project in their communities. But a lot of it reflects from the, uh, the community project in Teslin, my community, uh, which is where I've built up a, a reservoir of experience. Um, so we have an integrated consulting service. Uh, it's primarily focused on government, private, uh, private enterprise, social enterprise. We, we do um, a lot of business planning. Uh, we, we've been doing a lot of community-based planning and um, more and more we're becoming known for being an engagement specialist. Uh, we've, we just launched a virtual event service uh, to assist in dis, uh, indigenous decision makers in response to this COVID-19. So the first thing that we are doing is, is rolling out this virtual general assembly package. And we're working with a number of communities right now and have a series of technical people that have kind of this unique uh, innovative approach so that you can kind of maximize engagement across across all your citizens, um, uh, wherever they may be. Uh, next slide, please. So very quickly, and I, I'm, we're very short on time, but uh, if you've heard me before, I've been, this, isn't, this is certainly not my first webinar. Uh, we've, we've talked at great length about the TESM project. I'm just gonna very quickly, just if you are new to hearing me speak, um, we developed in Teslin uh, just under a one and a half megawatt thermal community-wide district heating system. It incorporates approximately you know, 14 buildings uh, across the community. It's broken into four district energy systems, uh, but uh, community-wide, it's close to about one and a half megawatts. It's been locally sourcing waste wood uh, for wood chips, which is you know, a lot of those things that Bruce is talking about, generating those opportunities. You know, we're, able to, uh, we're able to interact with the forest in a meaningful way, uh, you know, allowing carbon sequestering to open up, having an ability to utilize fire smart uh, wood. Um, it's certainly made the, the project more viable from, from a cost perspective. And uh, just last thing, the, so we, we've, I think uh, there's always opportunities, there's always heat loads, you know, whether they're the big heat loads or, or, or smaller heat load, there's always opportunities for expansion. I think right now, Teslin has pumped the brakes a little bit and have decided to kind of, how do we enhance what we have so there's a lot of work going into how do we uh, how do we resuscitate the the sawmill that we once had going and generating that uh, residuals? Um, how do we integrate that with the current biomass processes and how do we improve those? Um, so those are a lot of the work uh, that's currently ongoing in Tesla, and uh, I'm I'm eager to uh, give updates on that as they as they unfold. Uh, the next slide, please. So just getting into the journey. So um, very qu very quickly. It was in the 90s, uh, we had a sawmill. It was a very much a golden era, community economic development. I worked there, I was like, I was, I was certainly too young, I think, to work there. I was 14 or 15, but it was, very, it was a very intense, uh, high labor sawmill, but people were, were very, uh, very happy. And so that's been, uh, it's been kind of a focal point. You see it in this little graphic. Uh, there's been a lot of planning, forest management planning, uh, you know, I say zoning, but that's, you know, more timber harvest planning, uh, community economic development planning. And um, oh, the big opportunity that opened up 2016 was the biomass heat call out for schools. And so we responded very aggressively as a community. And that launched us into phase one. Uh, phase two was the expansion of it. And, you know, I think uh, Tesla has really embraced biomass, but it's one of those really important stories that need to be done right for you know, if, there's so many communities that 
get going so far and then trip on their own feet. Um, I really don't want Tesla to be that case. So at this point, it, you know, we're just trying to improve the processes, really trying to demonstrate the cost benefits. And, you know, instead of operating it like a government it needs to be operated more like a business. So that gets us into uh, the next slide, why business planning is important. So why, why do we do business planning? So Bruce talked about the strategic planning. So as a business planning firm, we, we really love to come into a community who's already done that strategic plan. They've, they've done a full a full review of their area. What, what, what do they have going for them? What are the gaps? What are the things that uh, you could really pull together to make a meaningful business case uh, for biomass? And then we come in and we really do uh, a lot more detailed research and operationalize uh, that strategic thinking. So really right off the bat, research is your best friend. There's so many options to consider. You know, I, I it's, there's so many technologies as Bruce outlined. There's so many uh, configurations. There's so many different things you could do, uh, but it's really important to see the project in the entire life cycle. You know, uh, you know, there's so many people I talk to and they have this great idea. They want to execute it, but how does that look full cycle? Well, how does that look in the end? Who, 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 who's this delivering value to? Um, what are the costs? What are the environmental effects? You know, that really goes into that strategic thinking that Bruce was talking about. Uh, but on, on a more business case level, what is, what is the cost weighed versus the attainable value? Sure, we could do combined heat power and generate all this, but what are we going to do with the thermal? What is there is does that value uh, justify the costs? Um, you know, and and that really helps kind of balance the thinking going forward. Do we just do one building or do we tie in seven? Uh, the costs go up, but so does the value. Does the value outpace the cost? So these these it just kind of gives a lens to uh, all the strategic thinking and. Uh, nice to have start becoming I need these and I don't need those. Um, but the real important thing is there's opportunity all throughout the value chain. You know, we're not just talking about changing out a boiler. Uh, we're not just talking about uh, building, a, uh, digging a, a ditch. Um, we're not just talking about generating uh, wood chips or hauling pellets. You know, you can create whole forest ecosystems. You can create a whole forest economy in a community. And there's opportunities all throughout that value chain, right from taking the, uh, you know, right from managing the wood to uh, harvesting the wood to uh, supplying the wood to operating the machinery, supplying the machinery to, um, you know, all the indirects that come out of it. So there's so many opportunities. And then all those peripherals, like what if we have a sawmill? What if we have a greenhouse? What if we have all these other things? Uh, there's so many other opportunities. Uh, just moving forward. So very specifically, we have to, you know, I, I have so little time and to talk about such a big issue, but our, our business planning, you know, business planning is so, is so complex, but very specifically, we're going to go through a bit of an example on a district energy system in a community. So I just wanted to be clear that everybody, and I see the attendees, we have some very impressive attendees, and I, and I do apologize. There's a lot of very great business planners amongst the attendees, so please bear with me. But for everybody, you know, I just understand that. There is a heating loop, you know, that infrastructure, there's fuel storage and handling, there's a heat plant, you know, in addition to that, there's a whole supply, you know, whether that's internalized in this project or you're leveraging the market already, there's already a supplier out there, but there's a lot of components. I just wanted to, to highlight that uh, very quickly. Uh, next slide. So when, when we're building these systems, we start to have to figure out, well, what are the revenue opportunities? Uh, number one, heating fuel savings. You see on this uh, chart down here, people keep throwing around, well, liters, this costs less per liter and this costs more per cord or, you know, it's really difficult to assess. What is the actual value comparatively between fuel types? So we created this little chart and you see propane on the top, firewood on the bottom. And, you know, what is that price? And we understand that, you know, 110 uh, uh, $1 and 10 cents per liter propane, $1.40. This is a specific community example. Uh, you know, in that same community, pellets are about 300. Um, a firewood is about $250 a cord. Well, what does that mean? We try to figure out rate right from a dollar to gigajoule basis. You can see offsetting heating fuel with wood chips is a $43 per gigajoule, diff uh, $43 per gigajoule for heating oil versus just under $12 per gigajoule for wood chips. The, that variable cost, that's probably one of the greatest uh, revenue opportunities and in and, and business planning revenue, we also, you know, th that's the cost savings. That's the heat fuel savings. 
Another one to think about is the maintenance savings and avoided replacement. If you think about if you're now, you know, sometimes you're changing out that system, sometimes you leave it in place and it just doesn't get the hours anymore. But there's now a long-term lifetime. There's an extension on asset lifetime that needs to be uh, incorporated. Uh, next slide. So just talking about some of the less obvious revenue potential, there's carbon carbon tax savings. Um, also carbon credits, right? That that was brought up a little bit. That That we're still trying to figure out the role of non-electricity based projects in the carbon credit market, but there is that opportunity. It is offsetting, uh, it, you know, it's considered carbon neutral. I don't, I don't want to get into the technicality of that, that uh, phrase, because it, it certainly is confrontational. Um, just something that's of interest. So, you know, we're working with a lot of communities. They see they have this building, that building. There's almost a business case, but they're right next to a giant school, the biggest heat load in the community. Well, now you're talking about a third party heating agreement. Well, that certainly ratchets up the risk, but we have examples across Canada. There's heating agreements in BC, in PEI, in uh, uh, New Brunswick. Um, we have a, a heating agreement that's tentatively passed in NWT, potentially one in Tesla, and it's taken a long time, but there's heating agreements, and, and they do share risk. They share cost. Um, it, gener you know, it, it creates a long-term demand, a long-term commitment, so uh, these are these are less obvious revenue potentials. Uh, next slide. So now just running through, okay, well, now that has to be weighed in, in comparison to the projected costs. Well, what are those costs? We got pre-construction costs. We got construction, operational costs. Um, and then just kind of running through what, what those costs, you know, wood fuel costs. We, we were talking about the revenue associated, but that wood still has costs. It still costs money to... Uh, to source that wood, to uh, transport it, to to uh, create wood chips. You know that takes labor, that takes equipment, that takes fuel. Um, there's there's costs associated there. There's also costs associated with this new uh, biomass plant. There's operational costs, maintenance costs, admin costs. Um, and then you also have to remember that in most cases we're offsetting a lot of buildings. But you know generally my philosophy is we don't try to engineer these. Uh, these biomass facilities to take 100% of the heat load. You're building things too big in that case, and you have redundant infrastructure. There is, I call legacy systems, the heating fuel systems that are still in place. You know, I, I try to aim for an 80, 90% offset because there's always going to be those real, real peak cold uh, days where you may need an additional boost from your, uh, from your uh, heating fuel systems. So in those cases, there's peak only fuel costs, as well as the carbon pricing associated. What is that? Um, risk contingency, replacement reserve and depreciation. Uh, these are just some of the additional things to consider. Uh, I'm just gonna run quickly through an example on the, next, uh, on the next slide. So we've provided an example here. This is, uh, as a business planner, you know, I, I think we've done, uh, uh, Red Renner's on the line, Red Renner and I, we do a lot of these business plans for communities. And the, the first thing we do is, you know, there's such a, a rich resource of information from the technology suppliers, from the actual people in the industry who will become your implementation partners. So kind of part of our process is we reach out to them right off the bat. And, you know, after we kind of get that strategic understanding from the client, you know, we kind of want this. We have an understanding of kind of what technology or at least what we want the technology to do. Uh, we start reaching out to technology and service providers, and we give them some, uh, we, you know, we give uh, through an RFQ, uh, a request for qualifications or request for costs. Um, we, we ask for, you know, just some upfront quotes. And that really builds into, if you move over to the next slide, uh, an RFQ comparison table. So a lot of clients, they really get, this is the part that starts getting a bit overly complex for them, you know, up to this point, they, they felt that they could manage, you know, they, they have good strategic direction. They've been talking to a few technology people, but it starts to get really intimidating. And I think this is why I wanted to focus on this business planning workshop is, how, you know, how do you solicit though that critical information without getting swept away in the, in the sales pitch? You know, how do you, how do you control that interaction? I really like the RFQ process. Like I said, you know, you really try to outline we're looking for these costs. You know, you, you send out that one through six. We want pre-development costs. You know, we want you to kind of internalize that in your quote. If not, you, 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 you add it back in after. But, you know, you're looking for them to at least be responsible for site development, for the biomass boiler system. 
uh, some cases, the fuel storage of feed intake systems, the, the district heat piping network, as well as the ener energy transfer units, meters, and installation. So you get all these bids from all these technical people. Sometimes you, the, the numbers are apples and oranges. The, some of them reference some costs. Some of them exclude others. So it's important to go through a process like that to actually see, well, bid one, it said one, three, four, five, and six, but it missed number two. But you know what? Bid two mentioned it, and it broke that cost out. So now we have a bit of a cost understanding based off of this comparative process. It just gives you another tool as a project manager or a community coordinator to kind of understand what's out there and try to make it all speak to each other. So if you look at the bottom of this chart, you see that we have uh, the subtotal development costs. That's the bid that comes in. But you got to remember, all not all all bids are written by different people, different companies, different perspectives. Um, there's exclusions, and so it's important to kind of identify what that exclusion was, incorporated in there, so that now you have a total bid comparability, and that's those numbers on the bottom. So just to just to recap, the subtotal, the bid that comes in is the sec is the subtotal development. That's the bid number. But going through this exercise of trying to determine what was included, which you didn't ask for but what was excluded that you did ask for to get a comparable number. Then you can actually award by value. Uh, so this is, that's the, that's the qualitative process. Then there obviously on top of that is the quantitative, or sorry, the other way around. This is the quantitative process. On top of that, you'd want to make sure that they have experience, make sure that, you know, that they're qualified, that they're reputable. Um, there's that, that whole layer on top of it before you make the award. Uh, just the next slide. So after that, you know, you, you, you have an understanding of how much your, co your project might cost. There's additional costs to consider. There's owner costs, uh, which is outside of what a contractor would be delivering. So you got to remember, you got to project manage this overall thing. Uh, you need a you know, the project manager, you need a construction manager. So those costs are, are showing there as a percentage basis. Uh, you need inspections, you need testing, you need insurance, permits, fees. There need, there, there's always going to be, there's always risk. There, there needs to be contingency. So then you start seeing here what a, what a, what a uh, district energy system could cost. It, it starts layering up. But then we got to look at the specific community. What does the supply situation look like? Do they need to build that into the project as well? That's where 9 and 10 come in. And it's, it's, it's not ideal because then the project needs to be bigger almost to make a better business case to offset you know, all these costs. You need to have more heat load. So it does create a bigger project, obviously creates a bigger risk. Um, but in communities where you don't have maybe forestry, you don't have wood, you know, locally sourced wood chips that are being pro uh, professionally produced, and, and maybe you just don't want to import pellets, um, that's a perfectly viable thing to consider. Uh, next slide, please. So that was just an example, and, um, and I, I apologize for rushing. Um, uh, I would like to spend more time with something like that, and please feel free to follow up with me. So on top of that, what else do you really get out of business planning? Well, here's some tools. Uh, definitely, you need to do a 10-year cash flow. Uh, and so that's all those costs and all those revenues that we talked about. You make those assumptions. Um, I'm going to be talking about some tips uh, after this. But in those assumptions, you, you just start, you just start uh, spending money and making money month to month. You just do that exercise. What does my 10-year cash flow look like? Then you can start figuring out some things. You can see where your break even is. Uh, you, bet, you, you can start understanding what your net present value, meaning uh, uh, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. That, that's kind of a present value uh, saying, you know, as in money now in my hands is more valuable to me than money three, four or five years from now. So there needs to be a discounting of that money. Uh, so that's what end, net present value does. And so you do that assessment. And if you see a positive project, that tells you that this is probably a positive uh, business opportunity or investment. And then the IRR, it's you know, right on top of that, it just, what is my internal rate of return? How much, my, how, what is my, in relation to what I've invested or the community's invested, what is the return we're getting, uh, the, the accumulated value uh, from these projects? Uh, just a couple other tools, sensitivity analysis. What, you know, we're using a lot of assumptions in this. There's some really big assumptions like the cost of heating fuel, the cost to produce wood chips. Um, there's a really great sensitivity analysis that uh, we, we do. And it just shows, well, if, if the change of heating fuel changes by 10 cents, what is that how does that impact our overall bottom line? 
What, what if the cost of wood fuel changes for whatever reason? How does that impact the cost of our bottom line? How does that affect this project? So that sensitivity analysis is really important. And then risk strategy. Um, as you go through these projects, I think the most important aspect of business planning is you visualize a lot of things that could go wrong. And then you start creating plans, strategies, and you just start building in components of things that deal and mitigate with those risks. Because, you know, generally, uh, we're, we're pretty clever people. We don't usually think of all the risks, but you can think of a lot of them. And it does add a lot of value to your project uh, when you internalize, when you build in those risk mitigating strategies. Uh, next slide, please. So coming to the end here, what are some tips that, you know, I just, I, I didn't, it, it's, it's so hard to dive right into this, uh, but, you know, I, I wanted to make sure that there was something meaningfully left uh, with, with everybody. You know, what, what are some tips on business planning? And I, I mentioned it right off the bat, reach out to prospective suppliers. But the other one is similar business or similar projects in other regions. Similar models, best practices, best practices and other examples are gold. You know, these, and I, you know, I think that's what RIBS is trying to accomplish, trying to create some confidence in other communities doing what you're trying to do, or at least have done something a few steps ahead and there's some learning. Uh, and that's what we did, you know, and it, for, as a community person in Teslin, we, we probably researched a lot, but we visited about 20 facilities uh, across Canada and in Alaska. And the best, best feedback was what was, what was done wrong. Um, you know, the funders are going to really like this, but you need to reach out to them early, get them involved, and keep them in the process. Uh, that, you know, it, they're the best champions. And really, at the end of the day, this business plan needs to speak to the, to the money. Is this project responsible? Does it produce more value than its cost? And that's what funders need. So, you know, you get them in the beginning and then they're part of that conversation. It's just easier at the end. You know, they're more advocating it rather than you having to defend it to them. Um, it, it just changes the it changes the relationship dynamic. Um, cross reference all assumptions with regional benchmarks. So as kind of ribs was talking about a model, there's a lot of models out there and there's a lot of associated costs that can be uh, identified from those models, which is great, but always cross references th those assumptions. The cost of diesel or the cost of wood fuel in a region from region A to region B could be vastly different. And there's so many things that go into it. You know, like it's I, I, wood chips in, in a, a, a isolated Alaska community can cost $450 per ton. Uh, or, uh, but in, in communities down in BC, it could be $50 a ton. That's a huge difference. So it's really important to cross-reference all assumptions with those regional benchmarks. And the last thing, and just the last slide, please, the ownership. So the most critical advice, and this is something, so I've, I've got to travel Europe. I've, I've got to see a lot of these very strong representation of best practices in what a district energy system could look like. And I see a lot of the issues and hardships of some of our local projects, uh, specifically in, in the Yukon's case, Dawson City. The ownership, the operations, and supply model is the most critical aspect of all biomass projects. And there's three reasons. Chris Henderson would appreciate. I have three reasons for that. Number one is because aligned and integrated interests along the value chain will directly influence the success of the project. Dawson, as an example, sometimes the supplier works against the interests of the operator. You know, and the supplier blames the operator. The operator blames the supplier. The only person losing is everybody. Uh, if you align all those interests uh, and integrate them along the value chain, your project will succeed. Feedstock dependability and quality, uh, that, that, that comes out of this. You know, when you, you, you need, the biggest critical, the biggest fallback of any uh, biomass system is feedstock quality and dependability. When you align the ownership operations and supply model, that becomes, that becomes a positive, that, that becomes a, a benefit of, of your project. But I think most critically, it's the local opportunities and impacts. You know, it's in the supply, it's in the operation, it's in the ownership that you get the most benefit and value locally from biomass projects. That, that you know, that's where you're getting the employment, you're getting the indirects, and you're getting the, you know, you're getting the value, you're getting the equity. Um, I, I just feel that, that that is often the most overlooked aspect of biomass projects. And uh, uh, coincidentally, the most critical. That concludes my presentation. Um, thank you so much. Thanks.
Blair, you know, something else uh, meaningful that you have left with me is that this work actually requires bringing about change within current energy and political systems. I think, um, you know, what, what, do you, what you described is an approach that sort of upends that traditional vendor consumer model and really focuses on the entire life cycle. And I think that's a fundamentally different way of thinking about energy. And, and honestly, the work that you've done is incredible. It's been nice to, uh, to follow along over the last few years. So thanks for that. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, I will turn. We'll turn to uh, questions now. If anyone wants to uh, post questions, we can uh, read a few out here. And if they're, okay, hold on a sec. I've got one at the top here from Tim Tucho. So uh, he says, what is the minimum number of buildings needed for district heating? So have you uh, have you looked at that type of uh, of issue in your modeling? I, I mean, every ca it's case by case, case by case by case. Um, in Tuzin's example, we saw that number. You know, when we had to add in a supply chain because we needed the yard, we needed the wood chip bins, we needed the chipper. Uh, when you added all that in, uh, the first I think when we were looking at it, the six buildings that we thought and that we owned that was very simple, it wasn't enough. And so we had to grow that project and it was 10 buildings was the magic number in Tesla. But one of them being the school, which isn't fully hooked up. It's hooked up, but it, there's not a heat agreement in place that actually makes that a value yet. But from the Tesla example, that was what was needed. That was the critical mass or the, or the break even opportunity that was required. But really it's, it's always different, you know, and, um, and, and that's why I brought up the, the heat agreement because sometimes you might just be at the borderline you know, your buildings, this this footprint, uh, it, it's, it might just be borderline, but then there's this really obvious heat load right next to you, but with this jurisdictional uncertainty, oh, it's owned by the housing corp or it's owned by the hospital corp. Um, but, you know, why, why aren't we all benefiting from these types of efforts? So, you know, I think that's something that my group is really pushing is trying to create the, these opportunities, these partnership opportunities between heat loads that are just sitting side by side. Um, yeah, anyway, thank you. No, that's interesting. Um, I have a question from Tim Hoy. He says, Blair, where do most projects get stalled out in the development process? You know what? Everybody loves a great idea. And I see a lot of great communities with strong champions with the great idea. And sometimes it goes to strategy. Um, sometimes it even gets a business plan done. Uh, and, you know, and it's actually start, or feasibility. You know, a, a lot of them call, are, are called feasibility studies. I, I, you know, I see a lot stall out in that, it seems at that stage, but it, it seems like, you know, once there's a business plan in place, uh, once there's funding attached, uh, once there's, a you know, implementation partner and that the project is moving and dollars are flowing and things are getting built, uh, generally it has the momentum to continue on and complete, to complete itself. But it's really on that kickoff uh, that I find the most. Interesting. Uh, Michelle Myers has a question. She's wondering if you'll share your thoughts on biogasification, combined heat and power technology um, readiness for secluded off-grid indigenous communities. Well, I mean, you just said all the key words there, secluded off-grid. Uh, that, that's, that's really the parameters for combined heat power. Um, I, you know, Michelle, it would be nice to connect with you after the fact or after this webinar to talk a bit more specifically about your case. I know this isn't the first time you've asked me that question. I'd love to provide you some feedback um, specific to your case. But I think just in general, and I'll talk about Tuzin's case, you know, we and I, I have mentioned to, to this group or a, a large number of this group that we were considering and we had partnered with Volter and that we were going to have a combined heat power system in Tuzin. But then when you start considering that now we have a, a supply chain that's not quite produced, it's not at all actually producing suitable chips for combined heat power, there's a more, uh, there's a more uh, uh, specific requirement, you know, a very, very tight parameter on quality that needs to go, needs to be factored into combined heat power, where, you know, we would have to kind of double our investment into our supply chain for now just one building, one boiler, or one, you know, one combined heat power boiler system that generates power ongoing. So that, that, so Tesla, you know, we're on the grid, uh, we're not isolated. It just didn't make 
it did make financial sense. So, but on, on a case to case basis, right? And I think when you start factoring that isolation factor and the cost of fuel for generating electricity, uh, and then the higher efficiency, as mentioned, you know, that you're getting more value out of your wood chips, um, there's a, there is a case to be made. It's just more difficult. And it's because of the increased uh, pressure in your supply chain. So, Mike, it's uh, Chris Henderson from Indigenous Clean Energy. If I can come in on uh, Michelle's questions and make, as I must make, three other points. Um, uh, Michelle, I've been on the board or advised about five different gasification companies in Canada. Uh, and certainly biomass gasification is, if you will, almost the holy grail of energy. And and companies like Nextera and Dynamotive and others have been in that space. And you can do it. It's it's just that your circumstances of being remote and, and small and, and on diesel uh, make gasification a challenge. Because typically these systems uh, have had challenges for full gasification on 24-7 operation. There are real strict requirements for uh, feedstock control, for emissions control. Um, but I will say I do think that biomass gasification will be a workable technology uh, for near urban communities or communities with large forest, uh, uh, forest fiber and feedstock supply and an offtake that could use both the heat or power or in fact the syngas, which is what you produce when you gasify biomass. So it's not something I would say that would be for your community because of the complexities with it. Uh, but I think bi biomass gasification is something that we've got on our agenda here within Indigenous Clean Energy as doing a potential collab on, because it's something that um, really is a very important part of the bioenergy future. Uh, three quick points to complement this. Um, one is that uh, I will note that with the Indigenous Clean Energy gathering that will be coming up in the fall, it'll be virtual and there'll be news on that soon that we'll have. We are making bioenergy technologies a bit of a focus, very much looking at some of the technologies here in Canada, but also some of the global technologies, notably from Europe, that could be a solution. So looking at matching technology solutions with community needs. Secondly, I think with Bruce, both Bruce and Blair's presentation, uh, what the, the underlying text for me was the importance of Indigenous communities in the bioenergy future. Without Indigenous communities being managers of silviculture, managing of forest, uh, forest habitat, managing the implication of carbon sequestration and the feedstock uh, uh, production and, and transport and logistics, we will not see a takeoff in the bioenergy market. And so I think bi Indigenous communities are central to Canada's bioenergy future. And my final point to know is that I'd love to see uh, and if there's anybody here from provinces and territories to speak up, because to my mind, the real partners of the Indigenous communities here are our provinces and territories who have the majority of control over regulations and and uh, and policies related to lands management and forests. Uh, and, and we really see that there's a closer relationship, and this will vary by province and territory, a closer relationship between Indigenous communities and provinces and territories as the bioenergy market develops. Thanks very much. Thanks, Chris. And um, I'll pose one last question to you, Blair, from Bruce Sims. So he says traditionally biomass plants are often built, um, I guess, to service residuals uh, next to big mills. Uh, can the economics work with bringing in logging residuals? I guess um, that question is framed from a community perspective. Uh, no, <laughs> I mean, you just don't want to haul wood chips. Uh, there's a there's a very limit and then residuals is even more uh, is even more voluminous and less dense than wood chips. I, I think you really start getting into the opportunity to haul long distance in the pelletized form. And that was, I think, one of the uh, a recent topic. Um, uh, Grant Sullivan mentioned uh, a project that they're working on. That, and that's a real critical issue, right, is is uh, locally sourced potentially or at least regionally realistic. Uh, sourcing of pellets, um, just because it does create a bit of a supply chain uh, conundrum. That you know, we're, we're trying to we're trying to generate local opportunities. We're trying to create local uh, local impacts that are positive. You know, I think a lot of the projects that we work on, we're very focused on locally sourced wood chips, uh, just because of all those factors. But then you know, outside of the limelight of these big community projects is industrial users and, and farms and smaller homes and all of these other users that just don't maybe have the uh, interest or the complexity or the or the heat intensity to have or offer uh, or be part of district heating solutions but would like to have 
um, pellets as, as a biomass solution on their smaller application. I, I think that's really what's missing in the Yukon and uh, probably in other areas, but in the Yukon specifically. But uh, yeah, just back to your question, like we've even talked about trying to haul our residuals to another community. I think, you, I mean, I haven't done the full business case on it because it's not really a real solution yet in our eyes, um, but there's interest, right? There's interest, but it, it's really important that you, you create the wood chips as close uh, to your source of consumption, just because the, the transportation costs, I mean, we're really trying to make these economical. So it's important to make, you know, make those kind of logistical uh, decisions very clear. But no, thank you for the question. Thanks, Blair. Great question. Great answer. So with that, we'll uh, wrap it for today. And just a reminder that this, uh, there will be a recording of this deck available on the ICE network. So if you're not already a member, please uh, connect with us and join there. And um, other than that, please note that the next um, collab is scheduled for July 22nd, and it will be focused on asset management for energy efficiency. And uh, with that, thank you all for attending. and. Uh, Really looking forward to the next session. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike.